Twenty years ago, a young man left Ireland on a lifetime quest of rediscovery. His aim, to retrace the living sense of his cultural origins. To re-explore, through his own persona, through poetry, experience, through study and passion, the myth and mystery of what it may mean to see as a Celt in the world of today. A world far removed from the living song of its ancestral past. Now the man has returned to his winter, to his island of memory, the land of origin. Returned to his dark edge of Europe. When I give a public poetry reading, I generally structure the poems very carefully and spend a lot of time selecting the pieces I'm going to read. And for this particular reading here in London, at the Sense of Ireland Festival, I chose to read poems specifically about the Celts, and about the origins of the Celts and their movement from the east of Western Europe and Near East Asia towards the West, Europe and the British Isles, ending finally in the west of Ireland. And to coincide with that, in reverse, uh, to try to stop for a moment in the Ireland of the Middle Ages and later more modern history, and then my personal voyage, Celtic voyage that is, from the west of Ireland east back to my route by way of the major route of the Western Hemisphere. Desmond O'Grady is known not only in Ireland, not only in America, not only in Greece, not only in Egypt, but, ladies and gentlemen, in London. And it's a privilege, a pleasure, and an honor to introduce to you the Irish poet Desmond O'Grady. Thank you, Andrew. I should like to thank those friends of mine who have made the effort to come here this evening, especially Giselle Dai, the painter, who has come all the way from America, I think, the last time I saw her was the Boston Public Library. Um, and I think come this evening to manage to get here for these few minutes, all the way from Amsterdam in Holland. And I should also like to thank many of my gypsy friends who have come all the way from Limerick. <laughs> Brian Quinn, uh, Jerry O'Brien, and his muse, Yvonne. And you know, those people who make the effort to get on the road. And the very first poem I would read this evening uh, will be um, a poem about how the Celts were on the Maikop plain and the southern Russian steppe close to the northern Iran border um, around about 2500 BC. And I have no comment to make on any poem I read from beginning to end. The people of the Mycop Plain. In Principio, farmer, herdsman, fisherman, one people over one plain, south the mountains necklace, the Caspian and Black Seas are jewel cast, snow peaks in sunshine, azure the spread sky, provocation for conquest. Numerous as stones by the sea's shore, the barrow grave mounds of my people scatter the open plain. And that will move into uh, the kind of way that the Celts used to uh, meet once a year at the great horse fair uh, in northern Iran and southern Russia, which is rather similar to what I recognized as a young person in Ireland uh, when the tinkers and the itinerant people met with the horse fairs and the cattle fairs. And their horse fairs 
although they may have been of our time, were also of a time that they knew nothing about and perhaps we knew nothing about. And this comes from a long poem called The Wandering Celt. And it's called The Great Horse Fair. Crouched on their women-woven saddle rugs, heated in parley, the chieftains hold council at our animal great horse fair. Taller than roof trees, each chieftain's standard at the place of assembly. Curve the great felt tents, richly embroidered at sunrise. Death the design of the dyed thread with intricate needlework. Like the morning skies, stars before dawn, the bonfires burn by tent mouths. In thousands, the hand-carved, bright daubed covered wagons ring the campsite. That was the year we shoved out west on our general journey. And from there, I, I move on into um, the move out of France with a poem called The Dying Gaul, where the, when the Celts moved into Great Britain and into Ireland. And with the dying Gaul, we are then face to face with what produced the Middle Ages with the arrival of Christianity and out of the Middle Ages and the art created by the Middle Ages in Ireland, an art of manuscript illumination and gold work and copper work and uh, monastic building and the concept of a simple kind of university. And since we all did our Latin with the Jesuits, we all have read uh, De Bello Gallico. And this is a poem from The Dying Gaul, a, a book of mine of 33 poems called The Dying Gaul. And in it, there is one poem uh, of a Celt, the dead in battle. And I derive the beginning of it from Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling at the very center where God is creating Adam, he called it, but I call it the Celt. <laughs> at the tip of my reaching finger, out of their tumulus past, I evoke their image. A mythology of shadows migrating west from the Caucasus and Anatolia, raiding across the pastures of Europe for forage and settlement. A darkly masked caravan of horse, oxen, and swineherd with their shaft hole axe and the block wheel. Again, from that complex Greece and the Balkans, the progress of copper and bronze to the Danube. Later, with iron for weapons and farming, they surveyed the Atlantic and settled, sleeping easy at night with the strength of the family group built out of cattle herds, the spoils of war plunder, and a man's battle price for his honor. And after the Vikings and the Normans, uh, and the Cromwells, and the collapse in 1601 at Kinsale, and then the famine, the ancient Celtic world and the monastic world was destroyed. And with that, the peasantry had nothing left for security but the old traditional ways. But even they, too, were slowly moved out by the Industrial Revolution, and destroyed by uh, modernism, my country. Although they have smashed our statues, have burned us out from our holy places, our gods are not therefore dead. They still guide us. And however, with the modern ways uh, against the old ways, uh, I was personally faced with a new kind of order which I rejected. And I decided to leave and go away and find my own order, which would be essentially Celtic and Irish. 
And that brought me to writing a poem called The Void, which is setting out, going uh, away by sea, which is the traditional way of leaving Ireland, um, going back from the Hollyhead Liverpool uh, or Dublin Hollyhead Liverpool uh, ship to Brendan the, Na the Navigator in monastic times. And so my voyage is a voyage east in reverse of the Celtic movement west. Well, in a way, I, I, I have a book called The Dark Edge of Europe because I come from the dark edge of Europe. Um, Clare Limerick, the Cliffs of Moher, and, and this poem is called Darkness and Light. And a poem like that, Darkness and Light, has to do with leaving the darkness of the dark edge of Europe for the light of the islands of Ionian and Cycladic Greece. Um, and thereby retracing the roots of my origins, rejecting, as it were, my present and going back to the roots of my past. Darkness and light. Dawn on my dark island, butt end of Europe, on my short fields tumble into our ocean, untold stone walls, height of my heart. On my brother, summer and winter faced with our land labor, Dawn on my dark towns, long rain, short sun, on black scarfed women in church lanes, dry as our one room museum. On our men, wedded with sorry separation, on all who depart to no long return. Light through lace on family silver, dark wine in cut glass decanters, memory of an officer's uniform hung in a wardrobe, memento of revolution, civil war, reminder of family division, emigration, remembered evenings of childhood, sick of confinement to climb through lilac, sick of confinement to climb over high granite walls, run barefoot in wonder on flagstones still warm at day's end, trial flights for fledglings. Long later in alien cities, loneliness of talk in the languages of others, of search to compare with the motherland. At times, solace of a gentle arm on the pillow at night in the darkness. Transient solace in a small island harbor far from the coast of my origin. Late at night with a foreign friend, I read the lines of our lives reflected in the nightlight's dance on the bows of the boat of our loves lived, lost, longed for in the calm cradle rock of the boat keel. For the seamen, all questions have answers built into the boat as the song is built into the harp playing it. Memory of darkness, agony of the journey, this son of suffering that raised man from his mire, raises me now with this line's movement. The mire is the monster, death the dark. To destroy my darkness, I daily work my light agony. Which br brings me to a small island where I live, uh, called the island of Paros, from which came the first Greek lyric poet, Archilochos. Uh, he was born and lived there, and he created modern uh, poetry insofar as he created classical Greek lyrics. And I take Archilochos and make a self-portrait out of him and find that, that I can find salvation for myself. It's called self-portrait. He house squats there, butt of the mountain, in that white farmstead built like broken box crate. But he's no farmer. Oddball outsider, he monger makes his money, fall through summer with his wonky wits that words and talk for the big shots live abroad. He's bent his back to everything will pay. Sailed, 
shacked with traveling people. He's not married. Story goes he once got jilted, lived sour loner since. He likes his drink and spoils for easy trouble where he'll win. He's got no double hereabouts, and if you cross him wrongly, watch his tongue. He'll reef you easily as a butcher would reef a rabbit. Odd josser, he in his soot black clothes and blacker scowls, his rivet eyes, arrogant look, although he's bred from solid stock, steer clear of him, he's all bad luck. <laughs> from there, uh, I take with me, however, uh, from there, a memory, uh, an echo of the Ireland I left, which is an Ireland of turbulence and uh, revolution, uh, rebellion, civil war, uh, and um, insurrection. And it's a, a turbulence that uh, is still with me. And I, indeed, I think uh, still with all of us who have had anything to do with that country, as it is very much part of the Greek heritage, and as we witness today, is part of the Iranian. And, uh, heritage of Iran and, and the intellectual heritage of Russia. Um, and with, uh, with that, I, I tried to make a statement about how uh, incapable pe people feel who have witnessed it all, older people, our fathers, in a poem called Belfast Bedroom, where uh, there is an up-to-date reality going on all day, every day, every night. It's called Belfast Bedroom, or if you like, just a bedroom. You know, we all are familiar with that particular confinement. <laughs> bedroom. Someone's butchering somebody down there, darling. Between those houses, their side. And that one's not dying easily, darling. Such protest screams are survival stuff. But that one, surely, if slowly, is losing. We, boxed safe in these cement flat blocks, pay no heed, hardly humor each other. Do it once, you're never the same. Won't again, unless gone gutter, savage. Many do in war and want. Kids can kill, playing at savages. Frogs, mice, birds. Then tie their bloody trophies to their belts, dance, innocent, tramp. Adults also kill each other when they think they're kids asleep or listening. That way, murder waits. We grown-up murder, too, through witness, omission, much as any picked or paid accomplice. The screaming stuff below, darling, that lonely deed is done. Someone we don't know, darling, has gone. The other won't live the same again. Good night, darling.
When I finished the dying gall, I discovered that nobody had ever touched the Gadotten, a Welsh poem written by an iron, composed by an iron in the sixth century. And it brought the whole idea of the Celt together for me. The idea that we had a, a classical tradition. And so I wanted to read the Gadotten, and nobody had ever had read the Gadotten really before, except specialists and professors. And so I decided to translate it and make it available for people like my children, for example. And so I sat down and I translated the 94 poems of the Gadotten. And an iron celebrates there, one after the other, like these tombstones celebrate mortality. He celebrates there. He really celebrates like an epigraph does, you know, the life and death of the Celtic heroes of the sixth century. For example, this one section of the Gododden covers the entire history of the Celtic people. Youth, exquisite with man instinct, Backbone in battle, many a horse hand high, galloped game thoroughbred, given their head, thick manes streaming, broad shields tip tipping rhythmically, tilting flank, swords blue bladed, flash of the golden spurs, gold embroidered the garments. What anguish between us! I praise you. The end, battle bed, not marriage. It's wrong that such friends should end in the claws of crows. And that is an epitaph which is also the beginning of a new beginning. And so that brought me from the dying god to the Gododden, and then from there on to the work I'm working on now, which is the wandering Celt. How the Celt came from the Far East all the way as far as here, right there. They sailed in that harbor, right there. And that's why I'm sitting here in Kinsale, looking out that harbor, knowing that they came in this way, and I can always go out that way. I'm also translating about another Celt called St. Patrick, who came here and made what we are sitting in possible, the idea of a Christian burial ground. He was a Roman, Roman-minded, but he had a sense of the Celtic consciousness, the Celtic way of life. And all my poems are essentially poems about what it is to be a Celt as against a Greek or a Viking or an Anglo-Saxon. So to do that, you had to begin at the beginning. Come here, come here, dog. And you had to begin at the beginning. And so I began in northern Iran, and that's why, as I was telling you, I went to northern Iran originally, um, and found my way slowly back here to Kinsale. And here, finally, at the end of this long journey of 30 years, I know I'm going to be buried here, probably where I'm sitting right now, looking out to that sea, that open gate of Kinsale Harbor and Kinsale Bay. And if you ever have any spare time, and you want nothing else to do, why don't you just come down here and look in? Because I'll be here forever. <laughs> The wind sets from the west, and the sun declines from its solstice. The sailor shoves keel to breaker, his broad sheet wide open, and settles his course to the waves tumble. Far from the land, tabooed ages thick by wind and wave, he consumes consecration from the high heathen sun and burns like a wick in that isolation which confirms his protection. 
All crossing water involves a search and the maturation, a vision of the imagination, relief from our daily grief, a reach for an answer or its equipment to act on. The foreign harbor made the boat fast, prow and stern. The voyager is in another country. When he returns, he'll relate what he has seen and learned to help kill the winter. <laughs>